Excuse me, gentlemen, may I accost you? Yes, of course. Yes. Planty or meaty? Planty. Could you tell me why you're here? Um, well, Dr. Williams is a world-renowned cardiologist. Um, he's been talking about heart-based health for many years, and somebody whose opinions I greatly respect, and I'm interested to hear what he has to say here. Thank you very much. Can you sir? Yeah, I'm Clancy as well, Good. and again, here to uh, enjoy the lecture by uh, Kim Williams. Uh, I've seen these uh, lectures before, he was the old president of the American Society of Cardiology, uh, and I think he's using a, a whole lot of data that probably a lot of people should take uh, more notice of in practice. So I'm very much looking forward to it, and very lucky he's flown in to do that. Thank you very much. And are you both doctors? Yes. Yep. Thank you very much. Thank you for letting me accost you. Thank you. Planty or Peaty? Which one? Planty. Flight Grey. And you know Planty. Planty. Can you tell me why you're coming? Yeah. Um, well, I went vegan three and a half years ago and I found that I had such great health benefits as well as kind of um, feeling good about the animal sake of the planet. And then I started to um, study as a nutritional therapist and I want to specialise in plant-based nutrition. And so, yeah, I came today because I think it's um, just really like, um, encouraging to see so many health professionals getting behind plant-based diet and seeing such great results. Yeah, and I've been vegan for six and a half years. Um, always been really interested in the plant-based movement that's happening. Um, and I'm a occupational therapist. I don't find that many of my colleagues um, follow the same sort of science, so it's really refreshing to come to an event like this where you're with like-minded people and it can get you really motivated and inspired to take what we're learning here back to our own practice. Fantastic. Thank you very, very much. Hi. Thanks for talking to me. Uh, I'm fine. You're fine, that's good. Yes. And can you tell me why you're here? Well, I, I, well, I need to be a doctor, yes. then I quit medicine and went into you know, health and fitness. Um, obviously, as a vegan, you ask so many questions, you know, why are you vegan, where did you support me, and all that. So I started uh, studying a lot about you know, nutrition, and I came to the conference in March, and I really enjoyed it. I'm actually going back to university to get my master's in nutrition so that I can go back you know, to work on based nutrition. So obviously, you know, it would be really lovely to actually meet and uh, listen to Dr. Williams and talk about you know, uh, how you can use plant based nutrition in reverse and health disease. So yeah, I'm not my interest comes. Thank you ever so much. Hello, hi. <laughs> Well, I guess I'm Planty. Um, in the sense that I was grown up uh, as, a, as a vegetarian, and uh, so I've not really had meat in my diet, but I do um, have uh, dairy uh, in my diet. So I'm not vegan as such. Well, not completely plant-based, but, uh, but uh, yeah. As, as, well, I'm a, I'm a doctor. I'm a GP, and. Uh, and obviously there's a huge uh, increase in prevalence of uh, chronic diseases, older population and uh, you know we can offer some things in terms of helping them in the way of medicine but there is an increase in school of thought that you know, plant-based therapies, nutrition could have a role in treating diseases and also preventing them so I'm here to learn more about that. That's excellent. Yeah. And are you using snot to your patients? No. Well I think we use it to a limited extent, certainly I do there, but I think there's more for me to learn. I mean, we advise about lifestyle, about reducing fats, reducing certain types of carbohydrates, uh, not too many animal products, but, but in a way, I think in medical education, it's not really taught in a very structured manner. It's taught as, you know, well, you can do this, this, refer to this. And often the evidence behind that is not so clear. So I think this really provides me, as a medical professional, with an evidence-based approach, which is really quite useful.
I'm delighted to welcome um, Dr. Kim Williams, Chief of Cardiology from Rush University. So this is a big coup. He's come all the way to speak to us on a Sunday evening. So a big round of applause for Kim Williams. Fantastic, thank you, Shireen. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak. And you didn't even out me as the tennis fanatic. I know, I'm sorry, I thought you tell us that. <laughs> so, the people have figured out that if they want me to speak, all they had to do was make it close to a tennis event. Exactly, <laughs> so, we were told. Right? I think I gave it away by wearing an actual official Wimbledon tie. <laughs> so, it's, um, it really is a pleasure to be here, and I'm glad that you're doing what you're doing. And uh, there are a lot of chronic diseases that can be impacted by um, nutrition and all kinds of prevention, uh, including medication and adherence, but um, exercise, um, changing your lifestyle so that there's less stress. There's so many things that people could do to avoid chronic diseases. But I'm going to talk about the thing that's closest to my heart, no, no pun intended, which is cardiovascular mortality. And um, so you'll, you'll see a lot of this. We'll talk a lot about the heart disease burden that we have um, in both of our countries, you know, UK and the United States, and then some of the elements that lead to it. Um, we'll talk about fat, sugar, inflammation, cholesterol, uh, protein, and overall mortality. These would be the themes uh, tonight. In the United States, it's one out of every three deaths. I gave too long an introduction, therefore there were at least two deaths um, but in the United States while I was just speaking. And um, being an African American, we have an, a larger burden than most of the uh, other ethnicities in the United States. It's an interesting phenomenon that everyone's genetics and your culture can change um, how, uh, how your outcome uh, actually goes. And uh, we have a, a very large growing well, except on the current political climate, it's not growing so much. Uh, the Hispanic population, I won't keep going into that. Um, but uh, the Hispanic lifestyle and diet actually leads to more obesity, more diabetics, and yet they have a longer life expectancy than the Caucasian population. And that Hispanic paradox probably has to do with all the other things like family and you know, uh, nurturing and things like that. We are not so fortunate in the, United, in the United States with the African American population who have more risk factors and premature death. And so, um, you know, having almost half of the population in, in adulthood having some form of cardiovascular disease is really not what we're looking for. And um, uh, but it's a, it's a, it certainly captures our attention in Rush because of the two of the big populations that we serve. Um, but it's not just us. Um, it's not just our ethnicity or our country. Uh, cardiovascular disease is number one globally now. Uh, we, I remember being in medical school and it was, oh, it's just a semiosis. And then, you know, we went from one epidemic to another. Nowadays, it's cardiovascular disease. We have exported that from the developed world into the underdeveloped world. Three quarters of cardiovascular deaths are in the low and middle income countries nowadays. Um, and the paradox in the U.S. and really around the world, because uh, some of this is international, this is American data, but when you talk about, you know, Italian um, uh, studies on what to do during a heart attack, that was the GC. Then you had the, uh, let's pick another one that's international, like the development of stents that came to the U.S. from Switzerland with Andreas Grunzi. You put everything that folks have been done to try to attack this disease and we have had this dramatic, as you can see, decrease in cardiovascular mortality, a 70% decrease uh, over the last four decades. Uh, the problem is, as, a, as we always say, all we're doing is mopping up the floor instead of turning off the faucet. Now, if you were trying to bankrupt your healthcare system, then you would save every life that you could and cure no one. Just imagine what that does to the insurer uh, or the people who are paying for it. Um, so, uh, you know, I mean, they're not hoping that you die, but hope that you get better uh, and not take a, a lot of resources. Unfortunately, that's not what's happening. Um, and worse than that <clears throat> is that there seems to be a plateau, and we're very worried about this plateau. Our, for, so our CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, says that it is obesity and diabetes that's leading to more cardiovascular deaths and that all of 
King's horses and King's men. I mean, there's all of the things that we can do with defibrillators and medications and everything that we can do is we're going to get to a point where it's going to it's going to overwhelm us uh, unless there's something else that we do. And I think we know everyone here probably knows what that something else is going to be. Well, part of it, that something else, which is improving our lifestyles, will change the obesity epidemic. It's a, uh, a terribly growing problem, no pun intended. Uh, and it's not just us, okay? So this is uh, the data from uh, UK. Um, and, uh, and talking with my UK colleagues a little, bit, uh, a little bit beforehand, no one was surprised that Scotland was the worst. Um, but it, this, is, this is lifestyle. And this is an opportunity to make a difference. And so yes, it, it has gone down, but if you look toward the end of that graph, there's a plateau that's coming. Um, and we're hoping that, it, uh, that it, we can actually impact it. Now, how do you impact it? This is actually lifted from the American Heart Association. They call it Life Simple 7. Um, and I, I will throw in some definitions you know, of, of my own. Uh, being active, optimally, that's 300 million minutes of exercise, moderate to, uh, to high intensity exercise every week. Uh, healthy weight, body mass index less than 25. N having an LDL cholesterol as low as possible, but if it's over 100, you ought to be doing something different. No smoking. Uh, if I could get that across to every Londoner, uh, it would help my lungs because I'm incredibly sensitive to it, and they're everywhere. And, you know, um, eating heart healthy, I put that in green for a reason. I mean, that really needs to be what we're doing, is uh, plant-based nutrition. Um, having a healthy blood pressure, yes, our uh, committee, I was pleased to be on the hypertension guideline committee that um, got so much attention, a lot of it negative because we changed the definition of hypertension to above 130 and said above 120 is elevated. That's the data, we weren't making it up. We were synthesizing massive amounts of data and everyone needs to have their blood pressure less than 120 to be optimized their health and the people who have plant-based nutrition, I mean, and generally hit that target without difficulty. Similarly, diabetes, blood sugar, the hemoglobin A1C, that marker for, um, uh, for how much sugar there is on your red blood cells, which depends totally on your last month's uh, blood sugar levels, um, it should be really under control. And uh, if it's not, people need to make some changes. And so um, I know there's some risk factors in there and there's some behaviors in there, but the behaviors actually change the risk factors. 3% is what we have in the United States. 97% of our, of our population does not have all seven of these in order, okay? And so we're looking at uh, more and more of uh, an epidemic. Why? Uh, let's see, is there anybody in this room who remembers these? I do. <laughs> the, the burgers used to be tiny, you know? I mean, and then they you started supersizing things and they got larger. So they were unhealthy to begin with, but at least they were small doses of unhealthy stuff. And so um, the obesity epidemic uh, really has to do with sitting down a lot. Uh, they say the chair is the new cigarette. That's very true. People are getting less exercise, spending more time in offices. Um, and you could look at so many factors. But the bottom line is that uh, there are 78 million US adults and 13 million, million children really need to change that um, their lifestyle, particularly healthy dining. It is improving. Uh, I don't usually use brand names when I'm giving a talk, but uh, if you haven't seen Happy Cow, it does work. It works in London. It works pretty much everywhere I've been to try to find healthy food uh, near, your, near your phone. Um, that uh, is going against the, the grain, uh, no pun intended, in, uh, in the United States, where the meals are bigger and the, the grains are refined, more red meat than healthy fats and sugary drinks. We're not eating enough fruits and vegetables and whole grains and nuts, and, and this data, we will, this will come home to root. Now, how about in the UK? It is, so overweight seems to be stable, but obesity is growing just like it is in the United States. And so, um, getting to the point where if you combine the two, it's 68% of men and 58% of women, it's very opposite of what we have in the African American community in the United States, where it's the women, almost 80% of them are overweight or obese. Um, and then in the lower right corner, uh, sort of uh, chatting with my colleagues, what is it about the Northeast, uh, West Midlands versus the Southwest and the London area uh, where you have this difference uh, in obesity, which will play out in terms of diabetes and, and uh, cardiovascular mortality. Um, so I'll leave you guys to ponder that, but um, if I was going to 
do a lot of these talks, I'd want to be doing them up uh, northeast to try to get people to understand that this is what's going to happen. Uh, where, where's the UK fall? Not as bad as the United States or Mexico, but it's still, uh, in terms of European countries, it's really um, you know, one of the higher ones. Uh, uh, yes, Hungary is there, but I think we, we thought well, that's because they're always hungry. But, <laughs> um, uh, but it's something that we really could, just recognition, getting these slides out to everyone to understand that, you, you know, it's probably, and I like to say this in the United States, and I think it's true here, that, you know, when you have a society that focuses on healthcare, so ours is the Medicare system for over 65, here you have um, universal health care, um, and you are, if you choose to overeat, develop diabetes, hypertension, heart attack, stroke, and not die after you've paid a lot of money into the system, then you're taken out of the system. And so it's your patriotic duty to be a vegan. Okay. <laughs> right. So part of the issue is calorie density. One of my favorite slides developed by Julianne Heaver, a good friend uh, who's a dietitian in, in Southern California, and um, this sort of epitomizes <coughs> that concept. The fat you eat is the fat you wear. But, and we also know, now know that the sugar eat is the fat you, you wear. But also the uh, eating an animal product is incredibly calorie dense compared to vegetables. You could eat four or five times the volume uh, of, of vegetables for the same amount of 400 calories in this case. And so if, the, if people just understood that and loaded up the plate with vegetables and had a little bit of animal product here or there, I know that's not good for the animal rights people, but for the diabetes, hypertension, heart attack, stroke, death, it would make a huge difference. Now, one of our major issues in, that we have found, and I don't have data from the UK to show you on this, but part of the problem is that we keep, we, meaning cardiologists and physicians, keep dying of heart disease because we do not know what it is that we're supposed to be recommending, and we don't know because we're not trained. And so our um, American College of Cardiology nutrition group got together, did a, a survey of our trainees and our practicing physicians at the American College of Cardiology, and found that nobody knows this stuff. So just summarizing it real quickly, and it's a lot of data, um, but let me just get one question. I recall receiving a high level of nutrition education that gave me excellent skills for counseling patients. The answer was 0% of our trainees and 1% of our practicing physicians. That's appalling, and that is why we have this epidemic, because there's no, we have a bunch of people who are, who are um, uh, gifted with the opportunity to help people with their hearts, and all they're doing is treating the disease, optimizing the treatment, and not doing much in the way of prevention. So, what is the data that we could actually change things? Well. Um, I would love to show you huge thousands of patients randomized trials. We don't have a lot of that, but we have some very convincing observational trials. One of them is, uh, uh, one group of them is actually from Low Center at Loma Linda University, Gary Fraser, the Adventist Health Studies. And you know, in the United States, it's a fairly large religious group, um, the Seventh-day Adventists. And they have, uh, they have been doing observations um, on health because they do have a medical school, and they have some very curious investigators. And they tell people, if you can see that, they tell people that they should be a, a lacto-ovo-vegetarian. They've been telling that for decades. Don't eat fish, don't eat meat, um, but eggs and dairy are okay, uh, good sources of protein. Well, interestingly enough, they don't throw people out of the congregation if they don't follow it. So they end up with this breakdown of five different diets that they're actually able to do nutrition surveys and then compare them with the outcome, okay? So it's not prospective randomized, but it's prospective observational. It's really not that bad. And this is the, one of the best take-home slides you'd ever want for avoiding our <coughs> obesity, diabetes, hypertensive crisis that we have in the United States. And that is, if you look at the non-vegetarian population as the baseline, uh, if you say anything above a biomass of 25 uh, kilograms per meter squared is, is overweight, then everyone's overweight except the vegans on average, okay? They, they, if you look at the, the non-vegetarian population for diabetes and hypertension, every time you change that diet by restricting animals, you get a 20, 25% decrease uh, in that disease. A little less difference between pesco vegetarian that is eating fish and eating uh, eggs and, and milk, but um, if, if you take that 
uh, as the baseline and cut it uh, completely to plant-based nutrition, you end up with very little diabetes, very little hypertension. Most of us would wonder, why does it ever occur? And that's because the definition of vegan, in this case, was, well, I went vegan last week, therefore I'm vegan. So there's going to be some residual disease that people have while they're improving. Now, if you're a skeptic, like I am, that is, I really do want randomized trials for everything because we've been fooled so many times, and I could just list them for you, folic acid, vitamin E, niacin, where we thought X, and it turned out to be X prime or X squared or, or something completely different. So you really don't want just risk factors, okay? If you look at the ketogenic diet, you'll see an improvement in risk factors. You want mortality data, okay? And so, again, prospective, ran not randomized, but observational, you do have evidence that there is a substantial reduction in cardiovascular mortality uh, when you do a vegetarian uh, uh, diet as opposed to a non-vegetarian diet. And this is uh, one of their more recent publications. I'm fascinated to stare at this data. The green, obviously, and red, they, I think they color-coded them perfectly, <laughs> okay? Um, that is, the people who are non-vegetarian, the incidence of non-vegetarianism in the population goes down, 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 down. Why is that? Hopefully it's that they're changing their diet, but I'm afraid that they're probably dying too, right? According to the mortality uh, statistics that I showed you on the previous slide. Whereas the incidence of plant-based nutrition is increasing, increasing, and hopefully that's taking away from the other groups and then not dying. You put those together, and I, I, I don't see the eighth decade here. Hopefully in another few years they will publish that. I bet the green is going to be better than, and higher than the red, at least I'm hoping so. All right, let's talk a little bit about blood pressure. I mentioned it a little bit, um, but it's uh, the favorite, one of my favorite topics. Uh, having been on that committee, I've learned so much from the people around me. I have a couple of little sections, but this, this was really a tour de force to try to get uh, data um, that people could digest, no pun intended. We actually uh, you know, emphasize the importance of having a good lifestyle, not drugs necessarily, but a lifestyle. And plant-based nutrition uh, is now in the guidelines as one of the things that we can do, uh, quoting this particular so-called meta-analysis, where you take 30, 30 studies, add them up, and say, what is the impact? And the impact is actually fairly large. And some of them, particularly the vegan, not just vegetarian or lacto ovo, but the vegan population tends to have much larger drops in blood pressure. And so seeing a 17-point drop in your blood pressure is more than what we'd expect with a drug or two. And so we could actually have a great outcome just by changing the lifestyle. So yes, <coughs> vegetarian diets are indeed associated with low blood pressure. It's a big deal to us in the United States because we're facing this aging population. Not, they're, they're not uh, just aging. Uh, there's an excessive cost growth of, of the health care. And uh, our Medicare system will be insolvent in 2026, no question about it. Uh, part of it is hypertension. Why, why pick on that one? Because that's 58% of our Medicare beneficiaries. And so we really need to rein in the costs associated with it. And, and it isn't saying that we're not going to give you medications, we're not going to hospitalize you when you had a stroke. We're saying, let's get rid of the disease in the first place. So, our, non, our guidelines talk about the non-pharmacologic interventions for hypertension. Um, the four to five millimeters that you can get off with exercise of the different, different varieties. Moderating your alcohol intake to less than two drinks for a man, less than one uh, per day for a woman. Weight loss, big impact. Decreasing sodium to less than 1,500 milligrams. That may not be true of heart failure, may not be true of, uh, of the general population, but certainly true of the hypertensive population. And increasing dietary potassium, so you're more than 3,500 milligrams per day. That's pretty much a vegetarian diet. But the biggest one, of course, I put it in green, the biggest impact numerically is your diet, whole grains, fruits, vegetables. If you are able to do, make that kind of change, reducing the saturated fat content, you will actually have a substantial decrease in your blood pressure. Okay, so I'm going to switch over and talk about sugar uh, because this is, is one of the areas where our plant-based nutrition colleagues, particularly animal rights people, people aren't looking at healthcare journals, they're looking at you know, what is the impact on the environment, the society, um, global warming, all of that really important stuff. Um, but a lot of, of that group has a diet that's high in sugar. 
and it's something that we should know more about. And I'm not going to bore you with the biochemistry of sugar, but I want you to uh, forget the last slide and memorize this slide. So I'm going to try to tell you, I'll show you that insulin is bad for you. Okay, you need it obviously, but the more insulin you get, it's a growth hormone. It makes your belly big. It increases the plaque formation. And so this is what you really want to do to avoid a, an insulin spike with a meal. What you want to do is mix your sugar with fiber so that it's more gradually absorbed. So one of the worst things you can do is take uh, a, a fruit and isolate the sugar and the water by juicing it. And the fiber goes this way and the juice comes this way and you take this and, and not that. So taking the sugar, fruit sugar, out of its context uh, will give you those insulin spikes. And so yes, after, um, you know, after realizing this ratio and how important it was, I try to stay on this side, okay? Uh, if I do grapes, I try to put them in a salad, okay? That kind of thing. But uh, modifying the behavior so that you're staying more on the, um, you know, I don't like blackberries or raspberries, but I like them more now <laughs> uh, than I did before because they have a lot of fiber compared to the sugar content. Okay, so I was trying to show the similarity, because there are a lot of people saying, well, fruit is good for you, therefore fructose is okay, and if it's not, you know, concentrated like high fructose uh, corn syrup, then it's going to be good for you, and glu glucose is not good, and table sugar, sucrose, not good. Well, no, they're really the same. And in fact, the surprise on this slide, as you can see, is that there are actually four elements, uh, dose-related, increases in, in, uh, in insulin levels, and white bread, that refined flour is just as bad. It's like eating pure sugar in terms of what happens to your, um, uh, to your brain in terms of the sugar addiction and what happens to your insulin levels. Um, so this is what we want to avoid, the hyperinsulinemia, insulinemia, uh, because as you get more central obesity, I mean, it, and these fat cells are, are actually glandularly active. I mean, the, the fat that you see people in the back of their arm, it's not doing that much yeah, they may, you know, may not like it, but it's not doing much to their metabolism. The central obesity is making them insulin resistant, um, which increases the insulin even more in response to a, a sugary meal, um, and makes them fat. And so, and that's when you end up with the diabetes and the acceleration of atherosclerosis, and, and as well as hypertension, indeed. indeed. So. If you, one of the best summaries I've seen uh, was this eight-page eight page article from um, Jim O'Keefe, uh, and he actually is a he is on our committee, and he is always not having fun with us because uh, we're always on top on on his case about being a ketogenic diet person, um, and we hopefully he will see over time, <laughs> but but um, keto and vegan have one enemy and that's sugar, <laughs> okay? And so this is one of the best reviews I've ever seen. If you took a picture, please look at it. Uh, I will try to summarize those eight pages of hard science. Um, the total cholesterol increases. The good cholesterol decreases. Triglycerides, which is basically small fat in your blood, increases. And then your LDL cholesterol, the bad stuff, may not change in number, but it change in, changes in character. So prothrombotic means that it's more likely to create uh, clots in your blood vessels. And so this is exactly what we don't want. And all of this can be reversed if people stop eating sugar. So I can talk to you about inflammation because that's another aspect of eating sugar and how we have found over time to, you know, particularly with Paul Ricker and the very famous Jupiter trial, that if you look at inflammation and cholesterol, they're both important. You're in the worst condition if they're both high, uh, best condition if they're both low. Um, that you could use a drug like uh, rosuvastatin to lower inflammation and lower LDL cholesterol. It has a huge impact, almost a 50% reduction in heart attack, stroke, and death. Um, and that's from a pill. Uh, well, if you look at sugar intake uh, across our population in the United States, it's actually high in a small group of people. And you can see that it increases mortality a lot. And so uh, maybe we shouldn't just use a pill to lower the, sugar, uh, the effects of sugar um, because they are, the effects actually are much more profound than, than we would think. Uh, this was published <coughs> relatively recently talking about sweetened beverage uh, intake and uh, production of diabetes. 
And that is because of that combination of inflammation and, uh, and um, uh, cholesterol going up in the wrong direction. Each serving, each one of those sweetened beverages increases your diabetes rate by about 20%. Artificial sweeteners, they actually do the same thing. Um, and that risk really has to do with the fact that they increase insulin levels, not because they themselves uh, are, the, are the sugar, but they increase the absorption of other carbohydrates. And so you, you, we always heard that stuff that, you know, drinking the diet coke instead of a regular coke, people didn't lose weight and they tended to eat more carbs. This is why. Their insulin levels are still going up. Now, all of this seemed to be a surprise. So we, we've seen the biochemistry of it, you know, how it messes up the cholesterol, increases inflammation, but we didn't understand and that it really did influence heart disease until that one, that probably was the first article, uh, one of the very first ones to talk about it in graphic terms, isolating sugar as, as uh, associated with increased cardiac events. Part of that had to do with this. Um, there was a, a sugar research foundation that worked hard to make sure that we didn't know. And it's, you know, I guess that if you're going to be the chair of the nutrition department at Harvard and you're going to take money to change the way research is presented uh, and, and keep certain articles out of the literature, you probably should destroy the documents so you don't get found out after you die. <laughs> but that's what happened. Um, now, so I didn't know about it because there, it was kept from us. But the interesting thing is, in retrospect, we did have a clue. And this was the Nurses' Health Study. This is eight years ago, um, where the Nurses' Health Study published what's so-called competing risks analysis. What do the nurses die from? And I remember looking at this for the first time, thinking that the number one thing has to be smoking. Okay? Well, it turns out that smoking came in third. Um, you know, going, the, the, the biggest risk factor for dying is getting older. Okay, I should have thought of that. <laughs> All right. Number two is actually diabetes. And so associated with that, believe it or not, if I isolate the upper right-hand corner, was a surprise. That is, yes, vegetable fiber decreases mortality, 16%, okay? Eating an animal product that has cholesterol increases mortality, 17%. But that 17% was actually exceeded by eating that, you know, Krispy Kreme donut, hopefully you don't even know what that is. <laughs> um, that glycemic load, that sugary meal, that sugar beverage, uh, increasing uh, mortality by 22%. Now, there are some diets in the United States that actually, uh, and I'm sure in the UK as well, that actually focus on both. A lot of sugar, a lot of saturated fat, a lot of uh, cholesterol. And, uh, that's, and this one is called the Southern Diet. Um, and that Southern diet is mostly African Americans. It's not just, you know, it's collard greens, but collard greens with pig's feet in it. Um, candy yams instead of just regular yams. Um, and this, this whole uh, idea of combining fat, cholesterol, and sugar ends up with much more uh, heart attack, stroke, death, uh, and, and kidney disease. So something that we could avoid. Now, we do have data that if you happen to grow up in that culture but you change your diet, like they did in, um, with the African American numbers of the Adventist Health Study, you actually do pretty well. Much less diabetes, bad cholesterol, hypertension, all of it goes away. Um, and the obesity epidemic that we have does not apply if you were doing the uh, vegetarian and even the pesto vegetarians. Now, I mentioned this a little earlier, and I just want to show you a graph of it uh, because that sugary diet. <clears throat> um, and the, uh, the processed um, grains and uh, a lot of oils such as french fries, deep frying something. That now has a name. It's called an unhealthful plant-based diet. Sure, it's vegan, but it's not good for you. And so this book was published last year in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology. And we compared a healthy plant food, whole grains, fruit, fruits and vegetables, nuts, okay, oils, coffee, tea, uh, positive scores compared with juices, sweetened beverages, refined grains, potatoes, fries, sweets, uh, and animal foods, all getting a negative 
the score. And if you compare those scores with the uh, development of coronary heart disease, what you see is that this increasing, the, the higher your score, the more uh, in red, the more you die or has a ratio for, um, uh, for coronary heart disease and, and death. But the dotted line is actually the unhealthy plant-based diet. It's actually worse than eating animals. So please, tell all your unhealthy vegan friends, okay? Uh, not, not helping themselves, even though they may be helping the plant. Um, so for some reason, um, they asked uh, me to review that article, which meant they, and they, I said a controversial thing or two in my review, so they said, well, you need to write an editorial. And I jumped on the opportunity to say this. We have not been delving, as cardiologists, into nutrition. We've been treating the downstream effects instead of putting it at its roots, leaving primary and secondary prevention opportunities on the table, pun intended. We need to do better. And hopefully people are, will resonate with that and look at it more. I thought that would be the most insightful diet thing published in 2017. Nah, it got exceeded by this one. Uh, this is really worth looking at. This is the Journal of American Medical Association a month later. I had nothing to do with it in terms of reviewing it or anything like that. Um, but what it did is draw cut points between high death rate and low death rate, depending on what you were doing. And again, this is nurses' health study and health professional follow-up study. So it's really good data. It said, if you're doing more than 2,000 milligrams of sodium, you're putting yourself in trouble. If you're not doing enough notes, nuts and seeds, this is, the next one is kind of curious. Um, maybe the people in the front row can see it and explain it to me. But it says, high processed meat increases mortality. But what was the definition of high? Greater than zero. That's in it. Should never eat processed red meat. Does everybody know what that is? Like um, blood sausage, <laughs> um, ham, bacon, um, uh, hot dogs. Uh, all of this, uh, anything that isn't where you just after the murder, slice it up and, <laughs> sorry, sorry and, and, and eat it or cook it, that would be processed meat. And it really does have a, a worse impact than red meat itself. Uh, low omega-3 fatty acids, that's a really good point. Should you be eating more seafood to get more of it? Well, I'll show you later. That's what we call a substitutionary benefit. That is, if you're going to replace, uh, you know, hot dogs and ham, with salmon, you're going to do a whole lot better. You're not doing your optimal diet, but you are going to do a whole lot better. Okay, low vegetables, low fruits, makes sense. Then the next one, high sugar sweetened beverage. And what's the definition of high? Any, any. No one should ever uh, drink those things. Uh, low whole grains, uh, low, um, trying to replace polyunsaturated fats instead of saturated fat, or having low amount of polyunsaturated fat. Uh, increases your mortality, and then uh, red meat actually did reach statistical significance as well. Well, that article actually explained one of the ones that was probably the most controversial thing that came out in 2017, and that is the PURE trial that tried to tell us that that switch that we all made to try to stop obesity from eating fat to eating carbs actually killed people. What people missed in here, and even though it's right in the methodology, what they missed is that, the car yes, carbohydrate intake was associated with higher risk of mortality, but the carbs were bad carbs. This was white rice, not regular rice or brown rice. This was um, sugar. This was white flour. Anything that's refined, um, it may taste good, but it's going to give you that insulin rise. And so, yeah, you, if you get rid of unhealthy carbs and replace it with polyunsaturated fat, you actually would lower your mortality. Doesn't mean that saturated fat is, uh, or polyunsaturated fat is necessarily great for you, um, but it's better than, than carbohydrates. Okay, I'm not going to spend too much talk, time talking about. Um, I, this is the section where I'd rather listen to you guys just to find out where you guys are, but I'm going to make some comments that are more relative to um, the United States in terms of business, politics, and health, um, because we do have a problem with subsidizing unhealthy food production in the United States where we spend billions of tax dollars making things cheaper so that they're available so people can get sicker. It makes no sense whatsoever. But it's in the self-interest of a few politicians here and there. It's in the self-interest of some industries, particularly the junk food industry. And so you have all the people are writing about it, 
but you're not getting much traction. And 1.28 billion could be used for a whole lot of things other than cookies, candy, soda pop. Um, and I actually found out earlier that you guys don't have Hostess Twinkies in the United States. <laughs> but you have fried Mars bars. Okay. So when I say Twinkie, you think fried Mars bar. Okay. So anyway, Twinkie is kind of cool. Okay. It's basically sugar and refined flour uh, with a fried cover. And they're incredibly inexpensive because they have 14 different ingredients that are subsidized by the government. So you can sell them and make a profit with very inexpensively. And who buys an inexpensive food? The poor population. So it is a regressive health uh, uh, tax on the poor, um, unfortunately. You can do some stuff with this. You can deep fry them, like you are with the line fries. You can slice them open and put a, a, a uh, hot dog inside. <laughs> uh, well, probably not good for you. That package I was showing you is 1,500 calories. Okay? Now, I ask you, how much spinach would you have to eat to get 1,500 calories? Okay, five pounds? It's actually 15 pounds, and nobody here would give anything. <laughs> so, all right. Um, so the, the question that comes up, if, if the government can promote it, can the government do something about it? And some local places actually have done unhealthy food taxation. Um, we've been uh, lobbying with the American Medical Association, as I mentioned, to try to reduce uh, unhealthy foods. Um, and we can have an impact with that, and, and I hope that everyone on, all over the planet is going to start to recognize how much this can do. So I'm going to talk a little bit about fat. Um, it became famous oh, ooh, 20 years ago when Rob Vogel did this forearm, forearm, media, uh, forearm flow mediated vasodilation. You cut off the blood flow to the arm and then let it go and see how responsive the blood vessels are and you eat a, a typical American meal, and the responsiveness of the blood vessels goes down. Well, that may be just an experiment, but that's everything from erectile function to running up stairs um, and getting more blood flow to your heart that you need. The, the blood vessel responsiveness or vasoreactivity is critically important for the function of your life, unless you're gonna sit in the chair all the time. Okay. Well, so it turns out that um, this, that goes a long way to explaining some of the uh, poor health effects of saturated fat, how it increases coronary heart disease. Um, it's interesting that this huge study from the American population got published in the British Medical Journal after being turned down from multiple American journals. <laughs> okay. um, but no question about it, saturated fat uh, increases coronary heart disease, and we should be taking that into account. Okay, another slide to memorize. All right. So polyunsaturated fat actually improves uh, your cholesterol and actually decreases mortality. Monounsaturated fat does it. Now, are those substitutionary benefits because people are doing more olive oil um, and vegetable oil are removing other things? Probably is because you have, you know, Caldwell Esselstyn dies saying no oil, no oil, uh, and he's got good outcomes. Well, he doesn't have a randomized trial between his diet and one that has some uh, olive oil in it, but it makes sense. So it may, I just warn you that it may be a substitutionary benefit. Now, and that may be because saturated fat, fat is so bad for you, but saturated fat even in, a, in, a, in itself is not as bad as trans fat. So trans fat is the stuff that you get in fast food. It tastes so good. It's inexpensive to produce. And the, that wonderful taste that you get is really damaging. Now, there's been a lot of talk that I saw uh, in Great Britain about what the impact would be if Great Britain would make a law to change uh, the availability of trans fats, banning them, uh, 7,200 lives uh, over the next five years. That's a lot of human carnage. And so I would say, um, go for it. Get behind whatever political mechanism you need, uh, because we do have data that trans fats mess up your cholesterol, heart attack, stroke, diabetes, no question about it. And we have data from mostly from New York, the United States, that once you make those laws, you will make a difference. So uh, this was published about two months ago, um, uh, looking at where the uh, trans fats by county by county are restricted and showing a decrease 
in, um, in actually strokes and heart attacks uh, if you were able to make that law. So, you know, it's great to have to ban smoking, it'd be great to ban red meat, processed meat, but trans fat is something that people could actually do a lot of products without and do much better. So, you can have it on that. Now, to finish the part about dietary fats, I have to talk about the American uh, Heart Association who stuck their neck out um, uh, to say no saturated fat, including no, no uh, coconut oil uh, because of its effects. And it's fairly controversial, but I think they did the right thing to stand up for uh, getting uh, uh, as much fat as you can out of the diet. The other side of that, though, uh, the ketogenic diet is not just fat, but it's high protein. And you probably wouldn't recognize this gentleman, he's very famous in the United States for having uh, the first ketogenic diet that was popular, so-called Atkins. Um, and the Atkins diet had some dramatic effects. Uh, but unfortunately, it wasn't the only dramatic effect. If you look at the published literature, it was very clear that it increased mortality, about 22%. So anybody who was thinking about that ketogenic diet, and what I hear is that it's fairly popular here, a lot of people talking about it, just remind them that, yeah, first you get weight loss, and then you get weight loss. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so it's particularly bad for people who have heart disease. So that 22%, if you were, uh, had had a previous heart attack, becomes a 53% increase in death. So no one should be on this diet. Um, those are my two favorite ones to quote, but that's Trump. Oh, oh did I say that? Sorry. <laughs> um, that is overcome by uh, a nice meta-analysis of 17 studies uh, where you put all the data together, 15,000 people um, looking very carefully and adding them up in a meta-analysis, and this is the result. 31% increase in mortality if you're doing this diet. So people should not do that diet at all. Why? Because it has red meat in it. Red meat kills, and processed red meat kills faster. And we've had this data for a while. It's dose related. The biggest difference in this slope of the mortality curve is between zero doses and one dose. Okay, but it, it continues to go up after that. The best thing you could do is take all that processed red meat and substitute nuts. That would be like a 28 percent decrease in mortality right there. What's wrong with the meat? Uh, well. A lot of things, and I'm going to show you, but I'll give you really good convincing data. It's not just one article. Um, this is one of my favorites because it has so many people, uh, a half a million people, you don't get studies this large, saying that, yeah, 16, 30%, 22% increased in mortality, more so for processed meats um, than, than the rest. I have to mention heart failure because that's becoming a very large epidemic. It used to be, we used to call it the cancer of, of cardiology because people would die, you know, five year mortality is about 50%. And, but now we have such wonderful drugs that we can, you know, defibrillators and transplants and lethargy and assist devices, and we keep these people alive for quite a while. Well, to kill a heart failure patient, all you need is a lot of processed and unprocessed red meat. No question that you can increase the incidence of heart failure, uh, as well as the heart failure mortality. Now, along with that, um, it's not just heart failure, it's not just cardiovascular disease, it really is all-cause mortality. And so I, I credit this article with changing probably more people. I know there's a movie out there, what the hell, I know I was in it. Pretty darn good movie, changed a lot of people. But in the scientific community, having what I like to call my vegan propaganda journal, it's not. Journal of the American Medical Association, um, published an article like this saying uh, with 131,000 people, uh, a lot of men, a lot of women, nurses health study again, and uh, if you're not used to looking at these sort of forest plots, um, if meat was, or animal products were good for you, decreasing your death rate, they'd be on the right of the 1.0. There's nothing on the right, okay? And there are a couple surprises. One is that if you look at cancer mortality, that wasn't affected by dairy. That was a ratio of 1.0. Okay, that was a surprise. What was the other surprise in the cancer area is that even though processed red meat is a class one carcinogen, according to World Health Organization, eggs, the, 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 the numerical estimate of eggs association with cancer death was actually higher than processed red meat. So that's maybe what's going on of the difference between the over-lacto-vegetarian and the vegan 
is that they're putting themselves at risk by eating eggs. For the cardiovascular disease, or cardiovascular death, I should say, every animal product was bad. The one that didn't reach statistical significance was eggs, probably because dead people don't have heart attacks. <laughs> okay. um, but processed red meat was just extremely associated with um, cardiovascular death. Adding them all up together, there are no safe animal products. Okay? There are varying degrees of death, but none of them are safe. Okay? Not a popular thing for me to say, um, but I'm going to keep saying it until people stop eating them. Um, if you look at the, uh, how, how more of that substitutionary data, there was one that was published a few weeks ago that I had to throw in here because uh, A, it's as in a cell study, again, Gary Fraser's doing a great job doing plant versus animal versus, <coughs> versus death. And, uh, and what they showed is that if your protein was coming from meat uh, products, um, your, your survival was uh, hampered. There was a 61% increase in mortality. And if it was coming from nuts and seeds, it was a 0 0.6. That's a 40% decrease in mortality. So let's go nuts, guys. There's no reason to do this animal stuff. All right. So I'm going to talk about cholesterol and then leave some time for question. And, and, and uh, well, there's a couple more things I need to get to. Um, we'll get there. I won't do the quiz. <laughs> But this quiz is based on things that doctors have told me. You have to eat cholesterol for your body to know function? No. Uh, you, it's critical to, for the brain to function? No. Uh, you need adequate serum cholesterol for wound healing and tissue repair. Surgeons, read a book. <laughs> 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 Improve significantly with exercise and diet? That's actually very true. Uh, and then, of course, number five is the most truth about physicians. Uh, so what people need to know, is that cholesterol content is purely animal products. If you're not eating animals, you're not getting them. One ex there are three exceptions. That's Jell-O, which probably you don't have in the UK, I hope, right? Um, egg whites and honey uh, don't have any cholesterol. Uh, but people are eating most of their egg white with egg yolks, which has a massive amount per 100 grams. Of course, 100 grams is probably about six uh, uh, eggs. Um, if you look at cholesterol, people will say, oh, it doesn't matter what you eat, you're, it's all genetic. Not true. And there are large randomized trials that uh, will, if you add them all up in that meta-analysis kind of thing, you see a dramatic improvement in cholesterol if you stop eating it. Um, getting back to that whole idea of cholesterol and inflammation, there actually was a trial, prospective, randomized, but small, that talked about a vegan diet with plant sterols, viscous fiber, soy protein, and almonds, a handful of almonds three times a day, uh, versus a standard, uh, a low-fat American diet, or that diet, diet plus a statin. And the diet didn't do well in terms of cholesterol and inflammation, but the statin did really well uh, in both, but the vegan diet was just as good as the statin. Now, you could argue there was a low-dose statin and all that stuff, but um, you could also argue that you didn't have the exercise you needed. So, uh, but we do have randomized evidence that you can make things better. So the last section really is about the protein, because you get this all the time. Oh, I can't be a vegan. Where would I get my protein? Well, we can laugh about it. Okay. Or I take, I take it very seriously when people say this, because I hear this all the time. And this is, so I started really telling people, just think about it for a second. Let's see, you went to McDonald's and got a hamburger. That means you bought some beef. That means you took a contract out on a cow. Okay, so before you did that terrible thing, okay, before she was murdered and cut up and all that stuff, what did she eat? And they think about it for a second and they realize, grass? And so that, and that her wit, of course, with the triple crown, crown, you know, in the United States, the big horse, trek, whatever it is. What did the horse eat? Uh, hay? Yeah. And, and uh, last time you went to the zoo, you saw a giraffe. And the giraffe was up in the, was eating eggs and birds and squirrels in the trees? No, pretty much eating leaves, I think. Yeah. And so the bottom line is that you know, every mammalian species uh, that doesn't have the big carnivorous teeth and claws was like humans, they're meant to eat um, uh, vegetables and get plenty of protein from them. And concentrating your, your protein intake from animals has the dangers that I've been talking about. And so, yeah, uh, I try to inform them that um, the next one, 
is not an animal. It's peanuts. The same amount of protein per 100 grams as beef. Um, and so the varying amounts, the least of which is egg whites, because people say, I've got to have my egg whites for protein. Mm, not sure. And when you're not eating animals, you do not get this stuff. Trimethylamine inoxide, if you haven't heard of it, please Google it. People say, when you eat animal products, you produce trimethylamine. Your liver turns it into trimethylamine oxide. Heart attack, stroke, and death. And so um, it's associated with, with those phenomena. It's associated with heart failure deaths as well. Okay? And it has to do a lot with the, with the um, bacteria in the GI tract um, and producing kidney disease as well as heart failure. So, not surprising that if you were able to change your plant-based diet, you were going to lower your risk of heart failure, but also heart attack, stroke, and death. Uh, this last one was published in the American Heart Association. I might want to see the full manuscript, but a 28% reduction, reduction in heart failure incidence would be wonderful uh, wherever we could get it. Now, um, that heart failure issue is huge. The more protein you're eating, the more heart failure you're going to get. And that really wasn't vegetable protein, it's really animal protein. A lot of it has, will have to do uh, with uh, developing coronary heart disease, and I'll show you the statistics if you want, but the bottom line is uh, very dangerous to eat animal protein. Now, one of the last studies, and I just have a few comments after that, and we'll open up for questions, um, is this data has actually been growing for a while now, okay? Uh, this gentleman, the Karolinska, actually added it all up, Let's stare at that for you for a moment. About five studies in 1970 saying you shouldn't eat red meat. And then a few more, and a few more. In 2015, of 450. That is a huge amount of data. Uh, most of it's observational, but the fact of the matter is, it's an overwhelming amount of data. He's, he read all those papers. He added them all up. It says diabetes stroke, and that's both varieties, ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke, coronary heart disease, heart failure. If it wasn't for those six things, eat away. What does he blame it on? If you add up, it's a complicated slide, but um, on the left you have the Cleveland Clinic's TMAO that I mentioned. Uh, you have heme iron, you have nit nitrates and nitrosamines, and you have, uh, uh, hopefully you guys, because of the uh, sign political significance, you do not celebrate, celebrate July 4th in the United States. I mean, I'm sorry, in uh, Great Britain. Uh, but in the United States, there's a whole lot of heterocyclic amines that people are, would get when they're barbecuing that produce cancer, as well as heart disease. And so people just need to stop that. Um, there's another study in the uh, BMJ, uh, talk about another American group, really have a hard time getting healthy stuff published in the United States, so that's <laughs> coming great friend. Um, but when they analyzed their own data, the, the National Institutes of Health uh, uh, aging study, they came to the conclusion that it's heme iron, okay? And so we keep seeing that. That's the iron that's inside of an animal. It produces reactive oxygen species. So if you're gonna get your iron, it ought to be from plants, because if you're getting it from animals, you end up like the, uh, like the fins. The more iron you get, the higher the death rate from heart attacks. And it has to do with increasing plaque and then upsetting that plaque. So my final section is really talking about plaque regression because we, we've had this data for a while and it's largely ignored. We like to stent and bypass, but we should be removing it, okay? And we've had data for a long time ago. Now this study from Greg Brown was using a lot of, um, a little bit of statin, a lot of cholesterol uh, absorbing drugs and people didn't do too well, a lot of GI upset, a lot of side effects. But um, we do have drugs now, the, the better statins, that actually can decrease plaque. You get about a 50% decrease if you use high doses, um, but is that what we should be doing? Why, did, why not do it with diet? We have plenty of data where an angiogram will go from looking like that narrowed long segment to a normal segment, um, probably, uh, and we have data from Dean Ornish on this about the percent narrowing getting better and better as you do a plant-based diet. They have nuclear skin, my favorite, as a nuclear cardiologist, showing all that blue stuff is really bad blood flow. And you come back three months later uh, on plant-based nutrition, and it's not normal, but if the um, burden uh, of abnormality has dramatically reduced. Uh, and they published that in, in uh, JAMA uh, you know, many, many years ago, largely ignored. 
More recently, you have Caldwell Esselstyn, the no oil vegan diet, talking about nuclear stands that improved dramatically before and after, but also the angiographic equivalent, where all of this plaque um, goes to essentially to a normal artery over a 32 month period with a no oil plant based nutrition uh, study or diet. In his uh, uh, wealth of data, it's not randomized because he doesn't, all he has is a control group of people who didn't follow it. Um, and, and when you look at that, you have tremendous improvement in symptoms, um, you have tremendous improvement in outcomes. Very few people had uh, worsening of their disease, and some of them were things like not taking your, um, your uh, medication after your stent. That's a bad thing, but that's not because of the diet. If we add it all up, plaque regression, decreasing in diabetes, obesity, hypertension, cholesterol, we come to the conclusion, this was Walter Willett's group talking to the Vatican uh, a few weeks ago, saying that one third of premature deaths could be pre prevented if people gave up on it. So I would like to summarize by saying that, you know, we do have uh, more heart disease than we should. It's, uh, in, in, uh, it's driven by diet around the world. There are no generally safe animal products. Processed red meat is all the worst. Um, trans fats, saturated fats, sugar, other refined carbohydrates, all should be avoided. Um, and if it wasn't for all the diseases uh, that we need to be avoiding, it'd be great. But we, and we can treat all these with drugs. If, and that has an incredible cost, not just human cost, but financial cost, uh, a lot of which can be avoided if we would change our lifestyle and prevent things instead of uh, in the first place. Um, so I usually end on this slide. I have about a minute left, so I'm not going to. 19.75 is the number of vegan veg vegetarian card cardiologists we have in Rush. People always ask, what's the 0.75? One of my interventionalists who says he's vegan until 6 p.m. <laughs> But I, I do want to make one more point, um, and that is, it, it hit me not too long ago that what we were doing with nutrition and cardiology is very similar to the 1950s, and physicians and nurses pushing cigarettes, okay? We, they knew that there was deadliness, they knew that there were studies, largely ignored, and it took the, a gutsy Surgeon General to put warning labels on packages. At some point, we have to have the will to take the data and translate that to warning labels on animal products. And when we do that, we won't have stuff like my friend, uh, John Warner. Uh, for a few weeks after, he listened to me talk. He listened to this talk. We're out to dinner and uh, with a couple of the other society presidents on ACC. We got the ESC president. And you know, these guys are eating seafood. I'm eating tofu. And he's eating steak. And I'm saying, John. I wanted to say, did I stutter? Did I, what happened? <laughs> why, why are you eating that? And uh, so I brought it up to you very gently, of course. And he said, you know, from Texas, and that's what they do. He has a bad family history, but he takes a step. Well, just a, a couple weeks later, he's giving the talk in front of 5,000 people, and the American Heart Association president has a heart attack at the American Heart Association. When are we going to change? Okay. And so that, you know, infamous quote that I did, you know, two kinds of cardiologists, vegans, and those who have not read the data. I'm now standing behind it more. I was kind of running away from it, trying to explain it, but now I'm standing behind it because I'm sick and tired of cardiologists having heart attacks and, and dying. He had an LAD stent, he's doing fine, but hopefully uh, the message is getting through, and it'll get through to everybody else, that it's time to change everything. And there are three phases of truth. I think we've gone past the ridicule stage in plant-based nutrition. Um, uh, we're more in the violent opposition, but if we keep working on it, we will, it will be accepted as self-evident. So thank you very much. So we will open the floor to questions. Um, anyone want to kick off? Yep. Can I get this working? Uh, you mentioned ketogenic diets. Yep. And it seems to be quite a few athletes, especially cyclists, mm -hmm. who claim to be finding benefits from plant based ketogenic diets. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I just wonder if you had an opinion about that. So, to the extent that plant based ketogenic diets are avoiding unhealthy carbohydrates is probably reasonable. 
Um, and that, that uh, Jaha article about um, heart attack victims, that data, that increased mortality, did not occur if there was a plant-based ketogenic diet. Unfortunately, for most of us, the ketogenic diet means more meat. And I'm saying that we should be doing less. So I would love to see prospective randomized trials. Um, I wouldn't be surprised uh, if you got a similar amount of weight loss if you stuck to vegetable protein. I know that it would be good for blood pressure because of the glutamic acid content lowers blood pressure. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if we had a dramatic improvement in overall blood vessel function. And or that's quite lots of plant oils. So that's what they're doing, a lot of plant oils. So it's surprising. Uh, we need to go back and actually study that. Um, opinion would be, I guess it probably depends on what the ratio is. I know that Esselstyn would be upset with me for uh, accepting that, but you know, the Dean Ornish diet has oils in it, yeah, it has olive oil and the like, and people seem to do pretty well. <coughs> yeah. Yes, sir. You mentioned that, that rosulostatin produces uh, inflammatory markers. CRP. Is it the same with other statins? Dorbostatin, Simvastatin, or Rosuvastatin is better? So, Rosuvastatin is the strongest. Uh, they did the, uh, I think it was the Saturn trial trying to prove that they were better than Atorvastatin, which was the number one selling drug probably in the history of the United States. Um, and it turns out that they didn't power the trial enough for 1,500 people. So, that 8% reduction in events um, did not uh, reach statistical significance. So, so the answer is yes, the anti-inflammatory effect and the LDL lowering for a resuvastatin is a hair better than uh, a torvastatin. Both of those are so much better than the other statins. We, when our guidelines, we try not to use the other statins anymore. Thank you very much uh, for the talk. Are there any vegan cardiologists in the UK? Do you know of any? And if not, why not? I can help a little bit in that um, we, as the plant-based health professionals in the UK, have put out feelers and yet not had a response. This is my hospital of 700 consultants, and I don't believe a single one is here, and they have a large cardiology department. So I, I think the answer is no, but have you got any colleagues? Well, I, I had one, uh, but she was a nuclear cardiologist. Ah. <laughs> so it's a little different for us nuclear people where you see the blood flow effects all the time, it gets in your brain and you want to make it better. And so I'm not surprised about that, but I don't think that she had any, she was at the Brompton for many years, I don't think she had any uh, plant-based colleagues. Okay. So what is it we should be doing? Because we have failed somehow. You've developed a whole department full of plant-based cardiologists, and yet none of us in this room can actually think of a single cardiologist. What should we do? Well, well part of it, oh. Oh, are you one? Are you part of these cardiologists? No. Oh. <laughs> Carrie Bowers? No, Okay, we'll come and take the name at the end. Okay, that would be great. One would be great so, for the 60 I mean, million of us in this country. Right. <laughs> I, would, I would say a lot of it has to do with doing what you're doing. You know, so, you know, blogging, tweeting, uh, getting articles out there. When that, you know, there are no safe animal products thing came out in JAMA. I sent it out, everybody was sending it out. Uh, yeah. I think it's might be still on my Facebook page as the background yeah. picture. I mean, it, it's, it, we have to just get the message mm -hmm. out. But yeah. we, we continue to speak to the, the converted at these events, unfortunately. How many of you are already vegan? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, <laughs> right, are you okay to take a couple more? That's true. Oh, okay. you want to Just vegan. <laughs> Thanks very much for your talk. I'm from a psychiatry, doctor, psychiatrist, vegan. Um, but my question was, um, how does that translate into the, I missed unfortunately at the start of the talk, the, the blood vessels inside the brain, um, etc. And if you know any kind of stories regarding psychiatry in relation to all of this. So, so a couple of important points. I don't have, um, you know, vascular blood flow information. You could do pet studies of blood flow to the brain. Um, uh, so technically it's feasible. And so I would encourage you to try and get some of those studies done. 
whether or not you know the blood flow changes mood, personality, uh, psychiatric disorders would be another question. This might be sleepy, have you eat that big fatty meal because the blood flow brain, uh, blood flow of the brain goes down. Um, but you're asking a very important question because it was Dean Ornish that used to joke, you know, that, you know, am I going to live longer? Or is it just going to seem like it? Uh, and, but, and believe it or not, there actually is an answer. Um, there was, uh, I think it was an analysis of a British group that said that there was more depression in the, in the vegetarian population. That was probably reverse causality. That is, the people who were having these struggles had changed their diets and you answer a questionnaire. But if you look prospectively, which has been done, people's mood actually is better uh, with plant-based nutrition. Um, and so, I don't know that you can treat every psychiatric dis disorder with respect to my daughter, the psychiatrist, uh, but I can, I can say that uh, when people's lives are improved in terms of what they can do to enjoy themselves, which happens when they're doing plant-based nutrition, their diabetes and their obesity and their blood pressure and the threat of a stroke and all of this goes away. Um, angina pectoris, getting chest pain when you climb stairs. These are things that affect people's lives and they affect their mood. With the heart disease arena, it's so important because depression is one of the highest risk factors of dying after a heart attack. And so if you can treat all of these at once with lifestyle, diet and exercise, do mood elevation, uh, you're really on, on the path to recovery. Can you hear me? Sure. My sister was severely depressed about 10 years ago, and she was in a sanatorium for a while, in and out, and it was really not very nice to see. I'd rather see her dead back then. And she went basically on her own somehow, uh, on a vegan diet, not really the healthiest vegan diet, that came a little bit uh, later. But she lost her depression and she lost 30 kilos and um, yeah, even though life threw much harder things at her, she lost her husband and she handled it really well and she's really happy now. Um, and off, pretty much off the medication. And another friend's daughter with 17, 18 years old um, cured herself as well with a vegan diet. Uh, so I thought it was really interesting the study you cited where the uh, sugar intake was really associated with a lot of high risk of death. And um, I wanted to know what is the kind of mechanism behind that? Is it the damage in the endothelial lining or what, what else could be behind that? And also you mentioned uh, because of that not to drink fruit juice. Would you have any opinion on more vegetable juices? Like they're obviously very popular like green juices at the moment. Would you say they're okay or still not? So I would say that if you're, you, you remember that fiber versus sugar chart, if you're, if you're juicing it and all the fiber goes away, it's not good for you, even if it's a vegetable, because you're isolating the sugar portion. Uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, vegetable sugars are dead. Um, so I would say the mechanism probably is, as I was talking about, I talked for a handful of slides about insulin, um, because right, raising your insulin is always a bad idea. And so, you, leaving the sugar in the context text of the fiber, it would be the safest way to do it. What is it about the insulin that actually has coming on from that? What has the negative effects? Uh, hypertension, diabetes, growth of plaque, growth of the body itself. It's a huge growth hormone, very successful at driving nutrients inside cells, particularly fat and fat cells. Thanks very much for a great talk. Can, um, you can accept that you're among friends here because of the number of vegans in the room. Um, I wonder which would you see as the weakest parts of your argument or the ones that are most in need of additional evidence? So I would say um, it was almost a tie. Um, you probably won't think it should be a tie, but um, I would say the biggest issue that we have is the fracturing of the plant based. Data. You've got in the United States the Nutritarian, that's Joel, For Joel Furman. And then you've got John McDougall on the West Coast saying eat carb, carb, carb all the time. Esselstyn at Cleveland Clinic saying no oil. Dean Ornish, in his original study, there was low fat dairy, but she subsequently got rid of it. 
we don't have randomized trials of these against each other so that everyone would have a uniform message. Maybe it's not necessary. Maybe it's not necessary because all you have to do with all the evidence that I've been showing you, all you have to do is get rid of the animals and everybody will be better. Uh, but our, to optimize health, it would be good to know which of those different camps was, was correct. The other one, though, is really trying to um, get in our guidelines. And that's sensitive because um, if we write good American Heart Association or British Cardiology Society, have writes wonderful guidelines, okay? Get them into the hands of physicians. They trust them because it's a compilation of works synthesized by experts. Um, and those guidelines will never have our stuff in it because our stuff is not randomized. So, best example is the Mediterranean diet. How many of you have heard of it? Yeah, why is that? Because it was in the New England Journal of Medicine and a bunch of other journals because they did prospective randomized trials, 2,500 people in, in each group. The control group, which was extremely high, 30% fat diet, nobody should be doing that. And they compared that to uh, an extra virgin olive oil group and a um, nut consuming group. And I was doing this with my hand, that was the Kaplan Meyer plot. 30% <laughs> decrease in heart attack, stroke, and death. And that's what everybody came away with. Now, if you just read the rest of the paper, you'd see something very curious. There was no mortality benefit of cutting the animal products down to just uh, lean cuts of meat on occasion and a lot of fish. No mortality benefit. <laughs> in fact, there was no heart attack benefit. The biggest thing that it did by cutting from meat to fish is a decreased stroke. Okay? That was your 30%, which most vegans look at and say, uh, that's a 70% persistence, not a 30% reduction. <laughs> but they became famous, and they're in all of our guidelines now because they did a large prospective randomized trial. That's what we really need to do. And I, I, it's, I, I know it's difficult. Nobody wants to randomize people to die or have a heart attack or a stroke. But if we don't, more people are going to die and have a heart attack and stroke. One final question here. <coughs> Hi. Um, my name is Hannah Duffy. Um, so I'm, I don't have a medical background, but I actually have a uh, passion for health innovation, and I have a, a background in design um, and innovation. So I guess my question is all around, um, uh, it's kind of a mix between, um, in terms of, you know, it's all around behavior change, it's kind of where I see it as well, is, and, and so the comment around, you know, the, the smoking and changing the, kind of the phrases on the, the boxes. Um, and actually, you know, just the other day, talking to someone else in this field and saying that you know their family member doesn't care anymore about that comment. You know, they just kind of ignore it and they continue to smoke. So, um, in, ter in terms of kind of moving forward, and for someone like myself who has kind of the knowledge and, and passion for plant-based nutrition and also for healthcare innovation, um, but also design kind of design thinking and innovator kind of aspiring entrepreneur kind of side of things. Where do you see the next steps for kind of an opportunity in behavior change uh, in this, you know, for patients, but also for, I don't know, people in the hospitals or just kind of generally? It's a tough question, and since you do, you know, industrial design, I was going to ask you that. <laughs> but I, I would say one of our biggest opportunities is to try to affect the immediate. And I'm, again, I'm using the analogy of cigarettes. <clears throat> that is, we were able to cut the smoking rates in the United States by cutting all cigarette ads off of television. And then we went after billboards and radios. And uh, the billboards are still there, but the billboards have to have the kind of design that doesn't appeal to children, like Joe Camel uh, did. And so making changes like that really did impact it. And that's what I'm seeing is where we should go. Um, you know, we are looking specifically, we meaning Rush uh, University, looking specifically at uh, the healthiness of, of advertising in the United States. We're in the middle of the project, so I shouldn't assume the results, but, you know, if they take that plant, unhealthy versus healthy, plant-based diet score and score commercial, they pretty much all come out terrible. And so hopefully we can publicize that and get some traction around changing uh, advertising habits. That's going to cost some people some money. We'll probably lose, but we're going to try. Thank you ever so much, Dr. Williams. We hope we never have to invite you back because we'll find our UK cardiologist, but for the moment, we're very, very grateful for your talk today. Thank you for taking the time. I'm happy to come anytime as well. Oh, wonderful. <laughs>